This is the Page Publishing Book Club. How you doing? I'm Alice Dockton Rossini, a gastroenterologist and big believer in fitness and nutrition. The pandemic did one good thing for Dr. Joseph Planka. It inspired him to write It's All in Your Head, a self-help book of healthy guidelines to combat that other pandemic, obesity, accelerated by the COVID crisis. So the first thing I tell my patients is set some realistic goals. Is it the perfect body, better health in general? Is it the ability to walk with your grandchildren on the beach? Once that occurs, I then move into nutrition and fitness. But at very entry level and understandable terms, I cover the basics of metabolism and exercise physiology. But I think what becomes most important in the work is this concept of self-inspiration and motivation. To succeed, like the principles of muscle breakdown, you sometimes have to break things down and even fail and learn from those experiences and build them back up. And if you can do that, that's perpetual. That is an endless source of inspiration and energy. And you combine that with the basic fundamental knowledge of these things, everybody can have absolute success on their own defined terms. Now, one thing I noticed during the pandemic, I just wanted somebody to come out and say, we need to be healthier. Make sure your vitamin D levels are good. Uh, Zinc is good. Vitamin C is good. Taking a walk every day, watching what you eat. I mean, it just struck me as the number of people that were obese wiped out because the virus just seemed to attack them. You've essentially done a synopsis on my book right there. You've just nailed it. But there's a couple of things to be aware of. Statistics tell us that not only were we very, very unhealthy and obese as a civilization before the pandemic, Those numbers are concerningly increasing through and now post-pandemic. With that comes the baggage of not only decreased quality of lives, but also the economic consequences this will have on healthcare in the future, compounded by those we incurred with the pandemic itself. The trajectory of humanity right now is on this unnatural, unhealthier, even though that's not a good word to use, course for the future. And we've got to make those changes now. We talk about global warming this way, but let's talk about our own health as well. But all things are related. I'm a believer that if we take care of ourselves first, we'll have a much better shot and appreciation at taking care of this planet. That's for sure that we have this opportunity now. Why can't the new normal be a better normal and just take care of not only ourselves, but each other? So there are a gazillion books and videos and programs and supplements out there all promising nirvana and salvation in this space. But not too many approach things from the basic psychologic principles that I cover inspired by a pandemic. So going from absolute low and darkness and just building back up to a program of success, including the basics of nutrition and fitness. So I think this is really a book on psychology and inspiration much more than it is on actual physical exercise and what to eat. This isn't a a how-to manual. It is a why-to. And that's kind of what will differentiate this. 
All right, Dr. Planka, I think you're on to something. Thanks so much. Nicole Radosti Papia has been teaching fourth and fifth graders in Queens for 14 years. She wrote poetry as a child, but always knew she had a book in her. It is entitled Taming the Dark, a sort of mythological tale of betrayal, soulmates, sacrifice, and redemption. The story is about a girl who was offered up hundreds of years ago as a sacrifice to save her Native American tribe. Her mother did that while her father was not around. The tribe was cursed and the mother was desperate and offered up her young daughter as sacrifice. This young girl became like the evil deities like weapon. He trained this young girl to be, you know, his right hand. And over centuries, she's had to do whatever he wants her to do at night. Her will is not her own. During the day, she can can do whatever she wants. And she's aware of all the horrible atrocities she's done the night before. So as she gets closer to present day, she decides that she's going to try to atone for all these horrible things she's done by trying to fight against him during the day and try to right the wrongs that this evil deity is constantly doing in the world. He works through humans, of course, that are corrupt and evil. So she slowly finds people that she's going to work with to combat this evil. So there's these twins. They're my favorite characters. They're not immortal, but they have these special powers. The twin girl can read your mind and her twin brother can project what she sees. So if she was in the room with us, she could read our minds and then her brother would show like a hologram projection of what we were thinking. The girl twin is very mature and she respects people's privacy She's constantly, you know, trying to help others, but the brother, not so much. He's a little bit more mischievous. So when she meets them, she learns that they've had a lot of experience with evil as they've been, you know, around for a long time. And um, she starts to help them. They help her and especially the girl twin in her become very close because she starts to realize that she can help the main character whose name is Safina. She's thinking that she could slowly take away all these horrible things she's had to do throughout the years to, you know, ease her pain. This girl has been made to do atrocities. And, you know, the twin girl is trying to teach her, that's not who you are. That's who you're made to be, you know? And she slowly tries to, like, you know, relieve the burden of all these memories that she has, you know, by reading her mind and talking to her about it. And then in present day, the love affair that then happens, a detective and her path cross during one of the atrocities she is made to commit. And he tracks her down, but he kind of, sees into this world, this whole other world that most people, you know, aren't aware of, that there's this immortal, you know, evil versus good thing going on every night. And he starts to get privied into that and his role in it and how he's connected to it. So that kind of, you know, sets the stage for the whole entire plot of the book, plus him and her end up falling in love with each other. Of course they do. I bet she's drop dead gorgeous, right? Well, she is because she's made to be a weapon. So she's almost not like a succubus, but she could pretty much get whatever she wants because she was made to to be this way. Nobody can resist her, you know, and she's strong. She knows how to fight and she's gorgeous. And of course, when he sees her, he's like, what? So there's a mythology story woven in here as well. And the um, the beauty of it is it also explains soulmates and how they came to be, and how if you actually find true love, it's actually not trying to change anybody in acceptance of like the counterpart. For example, she is fire, and the man that actually wins her heart, he loves her for who she is, and he's strong enough to bear her strength, if that makes sense. Oh, it does make sense, and I love that character, Nicole. Thank you. Living on a small ranch in the hill country of Harper, Texas, gave Cheryl Bennett just what she needed when she decided to write that book she always wanted to publish, entitled A Rescue Horse. I've been, you know, researching on overbreeding of horses in particular, where they end up going to slaughter, where there are just so many that crowd the auction houses. A lot of them suffer, and I think a lot of times people overbreed them and backyard breeding type things, and I had connections with a couple rescue organizations that alerted me to some horses that needed to be adopted from a shelter in San Antonio. So I went down there with my trailer and and through the rescue, I was able to acquire actually a couple horses down there. One of them was pregnant. And then one of the horses 
was a big Pershawn uh, cross, big draft horse. And that horse was a big handful. This horse was tearing up our, our fences. It was food aggressive. And um, at that time, there was a big drought down here. And there was a shortage on hay and food. So people were just setting their horses loose. She was found loose by a sheriff. And she had been hit by a car. And they called the, the shelter to put her down as her name was Crash because she was hit by a car. <laughs> and then she became the alpha mare, which is like the head honcho to my other horses. And she was kind of beating up on them. And then I started thinking about, well, gosh, that would make a good story, you know. So in her case, I was reading about Houston uh, Mounted Patrol had a program where they would adopt your horse and put it through their program and it would serve their community. You would have a job to do. So I gave them a call and they were real excited about and friendly to come out all the way from Houston here and check her out. She went through their, all their tests. She would put some flares out there and see if she could um, not be afraid of flares. So took her to Houston. She was there for a while. She went through their program, and the whole program was wonderful. And then she came back. How many years was she with the patrol? Not even a year. Was she a better-behaved horse when she came back? No. <laughs> They said she would not get along with the other horses. So do you have her today? Yeah, I still have her. She's getting along with my my herd of my horses that she always with or lives here with. And so I don't know what their problem was. Yeah, but you did a great thing for this this horse. It's almost like you had a calling. Yeah, I mean I think things happen for a reason. And um so I thought this whole story was was great to get out there and so I thought I put it together and thinking about another book I have some more horses that have different personalities that all each have a different angle for a story that is pretty hilarious from desperation to triumph you know What's better than that, Cheryl? Thank you. On a ship stationed in Scotland in the 60s, Art Gillis got the job of Polaris missile crane operator when he was just 17. And that's where his story begins. The name of his book, Sobriety Castle, The Fall and Rise of Stuart McPherson. Alcoholism is a lonely demon. Up there, I had, it was like the crow's nest of the ship. So when I was up there in the middle of the night, it was a bit beautiful view of Scotland. And I, I made friends with an imaginary Queen Anne's ghost. A Queen Anne's ghost high in the sky in the middle of the night. And I made friends with her, and she kind of looked after me. And there's an exciting adventure after that. So the book starts out recreating um, life on board the USS Huntley, a ship that, that's in the junkyard today. It's in the scrapyard. So I wanted to bring that ship back to life. And also the stories that follow of the all the characters and that I met in the Navy, all the all the other Navy veterans. It's like 35 different stories in 35 different chapters. I decided to join the boxing team one time, and this fellow was a Golden Gloves champion from Brooklyn, was on the ship, and he was teaching the boxing team. We we're going to go fight against the Scottish boxing team, and there's this another fellow. He could shake hands with you and bring you down to your knees, right? But one time we were at the dance hall in Glasgow and and where we meet in Scottish lassies. When I introduced him to the, the was an African American boxing champion, he went and insulted this guy and he went and said, What are you doing? And uh, he called him all kinds of names and then he grabbed it, put him down to the knees and he said, I just wanted to, to see if I could beat you, and they went off being friends. So the title of your book is Sobriety Castle, The Fall and Rise of Stuart McPherson. Who's Stuart McPherson? He's a fictional character based on adventures that I had that goes all over the world, Puerto Rico, and incredible adventures happen in Scotland, Holy Rock, Scotland, and, and Greenwich, Scotland. Your subtitle is Alcoholism is a Lonely Demon. Were you drinking while you were having all of this fun? 
Yes, I, I go to the point of doing something and then they have a blackout and don't remember it. Like, I don't want to spoil all the, the stories, but there, there's stories in Puerto Rico, there's stories in California, Mexico, where I meet uh, Maria, my wife, actually. I've been married to the same woman for 50 years. So She stayed with you while you battled alcoholism? Uh, that's correct. That's an amazing woman. I've been sober for 30 years now. Sobriety dates April 1992. That's great. And I also am a writer, artist, singer, songwriter, and a guitar player. So I do all that kind of stuff. But I founded a sober living called Sobriety Castle. It's a sober living. And people from the Ren Fair came. One time I had a Renaissance Fair and it came to a meeting and Queen Anne's ghost showed up at the meeting. Oh, did she? Yeah, she showed up. She kind of looking after me like a guardian angel kind of thing. So she's still looking after you. She's still looking after me. That's awesome, man. The only way I can stay clean and sober is to dedicate my life to helping other people who are suffering from alcoholism and they don't have any clue there's a way out. Your heart's in the right place, Art. Thank you. An unwed mother, Yoshana Woods, went through some dark times, but through faith managed to weather the storm and tells us how in her book, Mama's Baby Girl. At a young age, my daughter was diagnosed with an intellectual disability, and I was like a young mom raising her, and it was a struggle. And then at the age of 15, she was diagnosed with a mental illness, and it was just a hard time for me. I was 19 at the time when she was diagnosed and she was like six years old, but prior to then she was in daycare and I noticed that she was struggling with learning, but I didn't realize it until she got more into like school that it was really serious. And so that's when we got her tested and she was diagnosed with an intellectual disability. You know, is she able to care for herself? Yes, she's able to make meals, sandwiches, put food in the microwave. She's able to bathe herself independently. The only thing she struggles with is reading at a high level. Like I have conservatorship over her where I help her with banking medical needs, when she goes to a doctor's appointments, ER visits, those types of things like that. But as far as like, she does chores around the house, she's able to make her bed, bathe herself, those types of things. But she can't drive a car. She's able to get around town because I schedule her bus transportation and it comes around to pick her up at the door. What made you want to write the book? I noticed that she was just different from the other kids. Like the the other kids were learning. They was reading on their level. Her speech, she wasn't able to talk on the level as the other kids her age. And so I started to go into a deep depression. And it was just hard for me at a young age at 19, you know, having her, her dad was in denial and I didn't have much support. And so the book is what what made me just start writing about the issues. It was just therapy for me. But then I look back over my life, you know, I have achieved so much, you know, I, I feel like maybe this was meant to happen so that I can share my story with someone that may be worse off than our situation. Uh, because in the midst of this storm, I was able to pursue my dreams of going to school to get my degree, my bachelor's degree in health information management. My daughter, she was able to complete high school. She was able to get her a job. So things are looking up, you know, I'm working at one of the top hospitals here in Nashville. So despite the things that have happened to us, we was able to pick up the pieces and move on with our life. That's great. You should be very proud of yourself. You just got to keep pushing on. You know, it's going to always be someone that's worse off than you. You know, there's always a rainbow at the end of the dark tunnel. You just got to keep pushing on and 
having faith in God and to know that he's there with you through your every struggle. You are something else, Yoshana. I feel stronger just listening to you. Thank you. All right. What is the biblical word for pandemic? Raven M. Brown thinks she's got the answer, but it's just one part of her book entitled As the World is Seen Through the Eyes of the Raven, Hear Her Cry, a book of inspirational poetry. On the introductory or the summary, rather, I wanted to put these things on people's mind to really know what is going on because I've studied the Bible I know this was a pestilence. Whereas if you call it a pandemic, people look to man for answers. God has actually shown me since then that there is more coming, but he's warning us. So I put three YouTube videos out. One is Solemn Assembly 1 and then Solemn Assembly 2 and Solemn Assembly 3 because I when things like this take place, a leader would call on a solemn assembly where they would fast and pray and repent and just turn from their ways. And when they did that, God showed them favor and he turned things around. And with what he's shown me, there's more coming. So this is a word that needs to get out so that people will begin to change because as long as sin is in you know to the degree in which it is these things are going to keep on occurring uh it's not going to be where a vaccine can take care of what god sends he's given us a grace period right now it's nothing i set out to do when i started reading the bible i actually um started writing poetry that's a gift i didn't even know was inside of me so i started writing the the poetry back in maybe the early 90s, and then it just continued. Basically, I started writing another book called The Bible Will Be My Textbook in 2018. And actually, after I started getting into the publishing process of that, that's when I decided to put the poetry book out because I had self-published it back in the 90s. Is there a, a short poem that you can share with us? Sure. It's called testimony. You say you don't believe in God. You only believe in what you see. I'm standing right in front of you, something you can handle. You mean to tell me you can't see me? What other proof do you need of the father and son's existence? You got a minute to hear my testimony. I won't leave any room for resistance. I came from drinking, smoking, cursing, carrying on going to clubs and dancing to reading the Bible, following his commandments, living righteously and praising. He exercised his grace, mercy, and forgiveness and showed me what it meant to truly give. He pulled me out of the world, washed away my sins, and taught me how to live. He set before us the way of life and death, but he didn't take away our free will. But he said, thou should not commit adultery, fornication, and thou should not kill. Our father only wants what's best for us, like all other parents would. He only wants you to live righteously and to do the things that you should. God chastens the ones who he cares for. This is one way he shows us his love, removing hatred and bitterness from our hearts so we will practice being peaceful as a dove. So don't get upset when you are chastised, for he's correcting you so you'll do what you should washing away your sins and imperfections, molding you to do only that which is good. All right, Raven, thank you. Finally, meet Emmy, age 10, and Brother Matt, age 5. They wrote a book to teach kids the alphabet. It is entitled, Mom, What Is That? What inspired us is that we always had a dream that we, we wanted to become a writer some days. And we always go to the zoo, me, my cousin, and my aunt and we always ask what is that what is that so basically she said the animals and we learned their alphabet through animals so you would say for instance what is that and we didn't know we asked what is that she said to us uh that's an ant and it starts with a and we learned it we learned the alphabet mom what is that that is a bear's ear a bear mom 
Yes, a bear starts with B. What'd you do for Q? For Q? Yeah. Oh, Queen B. Okay, what'd you do for Z? Zebra. Zebra. Everybody picks zebra. What's the letter you had the most fun picking something for? The monkey. Why? Because obviously it's because of the shirt and it makes me laugh. So do uh, kids in school know that you wrote this book? Yeah, we had a presentation and we also had presentation in other places. For example, for the school, we told the principal that we wanted to do a presentation and he accepted it. And then pre-K three to first grade came to the presentation. And when we were done with the whole book from A to Z, we, all, we, we sang a song about the book. We even recorded it. You guys are too funny. Mom, what is that? That is an ant. An ant. Mom, Mom yes. An, an ant starts with A. Mom, what is that? That is a deer, deer. A bear. Mom, yes. A bear starts with B. Mom, what is that? That is a cat. A cat. Mom, yes. A cat starts with C. Mom, what is that? That is a dog, dear. A dog, mom. Yes. A dog starts with D. So when you guys were singing, did the class start singing along with you? Yeah, they did. Also, Matt is a very good reader. He started reading since the age of two. Do you want to let him read a little bit for me? All right, you're sure. All right, Matthew. Spell read and learn. The mission of Emmy and Matt is to inspire and empower kids around the world to learn and play through the power of reading. Mom, what is that? It's, it's the conversation between a mother and her child trying to identify the letters of the alphabet through animals. The illustrations speak the language of a child who is so eager to learn the letters of the alphabet. The heart of the mother is so eager to teach her little one every letter of the alphabet. And what they see is reading time. Follow Emmy and Matt on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram, Twitter. All right, Matt. Thank you. And Emmy, wow, what a way to end this edition of the Page Publishing Book Club. Go to 710WOR.com and download the podcast. I'm Alice Stockton-Rossini.